Another 20 seconds of courage for me, folks, was just having the courage to apply to university. My folks, blue-collar working folks, God love them, I have a great relationship with them. Blue-collar working folks. My dad was literally Paul Bunyan. He was like a lumberjack, right? Not the greatest businessman in the world by his own admission, but a great human being. That's what I grew up with. We grew up in a small rural farm in central northern Ontario. And that was what I had to look at. My extended family, 36 cousins, big families. Not one of them, or I shouldn't say not one of them, very few of them ever went to university. So who was I to even apply to university? Who was I to think I could, had to what it took to go and do that? 20 seconds of courage, I applied. And you know what? They let me in, the damn fools. <laughs> they let me in. And actually, one of the things, I need to give them credit where credit is due, one of the reasons I actually applied to university, I had the courage, is because my older brother had applied and got in. And I thought, if that dumb son of a bitch can get in, <laughs> apparently they don't anybody in the University of Toronto these days. He's dumb as a stone. It's up to my perception. Truth is one of the most gifted men I ever know. So that's my story, folks. That's how we get there. And my purpose now is so clear to me. I've boiled it down into just really two words. My purpose is to inspire authenticity in everything I do. Whether it's raising my children, whether it's loving my wife, whether it's being here with you, whether it's laying my hands on someone, it's all about inspiring authenticity. It's all about allowing that greatness that's within to shine. It's simple. My life is simple. It's my guiding light. If it doesn't inspire authenticity, I just don't do it. It's that simple, folks. Do you know how powerful that is? To have something that guides your life like that? A principle? A purpose? A why? I know very clearly how I'm going to make a difference. And it's not being an RCMP officer, and it's not being a mechanic, and it's not being a long-haul truck driver, but I'm thankful that there are people that do that. Because just think, folks, right, how amazingly interconnected the whole thing is. All of the beautiful puzzle pieces that make that. Think about what it took for me to just get here. And for those of you who don't know, I live in a little city called North Bay. About a three, three and a half hour drive from here. Just think about all the interconnected purposes that allow me to get here. Think about the vehicle that I drove to get here. There had to be a metallurgist at some point, a chemist and a mineralogist who was out there finding these minerals and things that make up nickel, steel, aluminum, so that somebody could cast the parts that created the internal combustion engine. But there had to be an engineer who actually figured out the internal combustion engine years ago. And then there had to be some dude years ago who figured out this thing called the wheel. That was his purpose, his making a difference in the world. And then there was this people at the Michelin plant who learned how to put rubber on it because that made the road a, a whole lot smoother. And then there was somebody else who actually was into, you know, discovering this thing we call crude oil and figuring out that if you cracked it and burned it down, that we could make this thing called gasoline to put in the internal combustion so we could get there. Do you see how many people, how many puzzle pieces it took, folks, just for me to get into my car to drive here? And that's not talking about the engineers and the people who did the, the road studies to figure out how to put the road there. Or to figure out, you know, the guy that had the courage to have his own construction company, the, the trucks and the, the loaders and the things that they were able to clear the road so that they could build the road, so they could drive the car. Do you see how complex this is, folks? It boggles my mind that this funny little green and blue planet spins as well as it does. The seven billion of us, relatively speaking, get along. Let's put this in a car breaking context. There was a talk that I gave in my community to a bunch of moms because, as I said, my practice was largely made up of families, children, cash, paying children, and, and, and moms and dads. And I gave a talk, and this mom came up to me after the talk, and she said, Doc, do you think there's anything you can do for my little girl? I said, tell me what's your little girl? And she said, well, she's been kicked out of every preschool in town. There's only six of them. She's been kicked out of every one for behavior problems. She was only three years old. And she said, she is really a handful for us. She takes temper tantrums on average 100 to 150 a day. She said she's the kind of kid that um, literally will, you know, we're out somewhere in public and, you know, she'll just, you know, stir the pot just to, just to get a rise out of people. She's the kind of little girl who goes over to her older sister and looks straight in the eye and pulls her hair until she cries and laughs. She said, based upon what you said, that funny word that you said that rhymes with subway station, what you say? I said, oh, subluxation. She said, yeah, do you think she subluxated. Do you think there's anything you can do to help my little girl? I said, I don't know. But if she subluxated, maybe there is. Because inside every being, just like I was talking about the dog boomer, inside every being is a perfect innate gift from the creator. Yes or yes? Yeah. And I knew inside that little girl that was a perfect little being. And so we brought her in the office. And we started doing the only thing that I know how to do. My niche was to adjust her. 
And we started to notice changes because she went from taking, in the, you know, in the 12 to 20 minutes she was in our office, she would sometimes have 10 to 15 pepper tantrums while she was there. I actually saw her on the table one time pull her sister's hair until she cried in the lab. We weren't noticing that. She hadn't actually, we actually gave her a little star because when she came in on about the fifth or sixth week, she stopped throwing toys at the other kids in the toy area. It was a miracle. And we were with her 24 7 when we started to see what we perceived to be a more authentic expression of who she really was. Not the subluxated version that her parents had grown to know and were loving anyway. The mom always brought her, I never met the dad. And then finally one day we heard that Andy was there. And Andy was uh, one of those guys that's about this tall, but like about this wide. I'm sure he went to play football. <clears throat> and he was really stern. And in those days, uh, we still had uh, swinging doors on some of the adjusting areas. And so I went. I was back and the girls came back and, and uh, Andy came back. And I was adjusting the girls and uh, I adjusted the oldest sister and she jumped off and ran and then I adjusted Victoria and she jumped off and ran. And then I said, all right, great, we'll see you on Thursday. And I went to walk out and as I did, Andy turned and he went Shh, and he pushed the door shut. And he said, I want to talk to you. Well, I'm setting his courage, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what's on your mind? He goes, I wanted to come here to see what it was you were doing. And he says, I don't know what the hell you've been doing. I hope this poke is rude as shit. He says, I'm not sure I agree with what you did. But he said, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, one dad to another, for giving me my little girl back. Victoria now is older, she's starting college. I contend that she's got a different life, she's got a different path, because I was willing to have 20 seconds of courage. I was willing to go out in my community and give a talk, and the mom was willing to create courageous enough to come and talk to me. How big of a difference can you make with your life, folks? How big of a difference can you make? Think about this, folks. Think about it from a chiropractic standpoint. Think about a gentleman named Martin. What a gifted orator he could have been. This is a hypothetical story, but I don't know that it's that hypothetical. You're not willing to have 20 seconds of courage. You're not willing to get out of your community. You're not willing to do a talk. We're going to rewind the hands of times back into you know earlier times, maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago. And there's a little, there's a woman who's a school teacher who's in your, in your, could be in your practice. But because you haven't gone out to do a talk at the PTA, because you haven't gone out there and spoken and attracted in some way and let her find you to know what carpet to carry is, she's a girl who suffers. Her subluxation pattern shows up as migraine cluster headaches. And imagine little Martin, little Marty. Two, he's in grade seven years old. He's in grade two. And he's got to do his first oral presentation. But you remember my story? One 50 minute oral presentation let me let go of my dream when I was 10 years old. Can you imagine how terrifying it'd be six, seven year old to have to do an oral presentation? Number one fear in the world is what, folks? Public speaking. What's number four? Dying. People are four times more afraid of speaking in front of the public than they are of dying. So in my fictional story, imagine this. Little Marty goes, you know what? 